This is a seven millimeter broadcast. That's gonna stabilize just fine in that nine and a half. Not a problem at all. But as everybody pretty much knows almost by instinct, I'll put another grain in and see what I get. And you should see the progression, 25, 25, 50, 26, 26, 75, however it moves up the scale. Lucky number seven, it's, whoa. <laughs> is this a true statement? <laughs> No, it might have been true to that guy, but it's not true to me. I'm just surprised that some gunsmith couldn't figure it out. They will literally get torn apart by that fast rifling twist. Yeah, that's the new hot seven millimeter from Hornady that I think is going to take over from the seven rem bag. Wow, lots of cartridges. Right out of the box with factory ammunition, we'll shoot minute of angle which is more than good enough for 99.99% .99 of all big game hunting you're ever going to want to do. I have bent it, worked on it, and frigged with that ejector for years and no success. We need something snazzy to catch their attention. Let's call it the... Lucky number seven, it's been lucky for me, so lucky that I wrote a book. <laughs> on the seven millimeter cartridges. And the team said this week, we're going to do something special on Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast. They have collected questions and comments from everyone they could find about seven millimeter cartridges. So whether you love the seven millimeters or are just interested in learning more about them, stay tuned because this is a seven millimeter broadcast. Hello everyone. Say as usual, we are going to begin with um, our patrons and and Gorm has written in about some seven millimeters. Let's see what he had to say and how I answered him. Hi, Ron, I have a question about sectional density. I know the draw to the seven millimeter is that they have the same sectional density as a heavier weight bullet in a 30 caliber. For example, a 150 grain seven millimeter bullet has the same sectional density as a 176 grain 30 caliber bullet. Both of those are around 0.266. So, if a 175 to 180 grain 30 caliber bullet is sufficient for a large game such as elk, moose, and bears, doesn't that mean that theoretically, with bullet construction being equal, a 150 grain bullet out of a seven millimeter is sufficient for the same large game animals? I know terminal sectional density also plays a role in all of this, but I don't want to get too much into the weeds with all of that, as that seems to be affected more by the bullet's construction and expansion and weight retention than just the straight sectional density. Love your videos and broadcasts. Keep up the great work and information. Well, thanks, Gorm. Obviously, I really appreciate that, and I appreciate your support. Now, you're on the right track here because, yes, you are getting the same sectional density out of that bullet. But the one thing we're missing is the momentum of the heavier projectile. So you add that in and it's a little difficult to predict exactly who's going to penetrate the farthest. But as everybody pretty much knows almost by instinct, the heavier bullet at the same velocity should do more damage. But once again, what you talked about with your bullet constructions and materials and stuff can make a big difference. What I have noticed, though, over many, many years of hunting big game, the ones you mentioned here and, and others with the seven millimeters, is that a good um, controlled expansion 150 grain bullet out of a seven rim mag, 280 Ackley improved, even my 284s and seven millimeter 08s have done just a remarkable job. Deep, deep penetration and just really effective at taking game. So you're on the right track there. Sectional density numbers you've got figured out. But boy, when you start comparing different bullet constructions and materials, a lot of that changes. And one other thing, the terminal um, sectional density that you mentioned, that means once your bullet has landed and expanded, its sectional density sort of changes because how much has it lost? With your lead bullets, you're going to be losing some mass. So even though you had a high sectional density starting, once it begins progressing through the animal and breaks up or sheds some of its lead, you lose sectional density. Uh, so a lot of things are changing there, but good point and well thought out. Now, this is another patron, Jonathan. I've been a 30 caliber guy most of my life, but the data on the seven millimeters seems pretty persuasive. <laughs> All of a sudden, I have a seven millimeter 08 for my kiddos and a seven PRC for myself. 
I'm hopeful that they'll reap a bountiful harvest during hunting season. <laughs> well, Jonathan, I think they will. We have just had wonderful luck with the 7mm 08 here. Betsy really loves to shoot it. She's hunted Africa with it as well as North America. I will use it from time to time. It's quite similar to a 757 Mauser and my beloved 284 Winchester. And we've just... Uh, wholeheartedly support you with that one and the seven prc i think you will find that that does everything the seven rem mag has done all these years plus a little bit more because of those beautiful high bc bullets you can shoot out of it if you so choose so good luck let us know how you make out with them wolfgang now this guy is from austria Wolfgang, Wolfgang says, hey, hey, Ron, to me, the seven millimeters are the most logical choice. <laughs> You're my man, Wolfgang. I am shooting a 7x64 with an RWS lead-free 140 grain bullet, low recoil, flat shooting. I use it for fox, roe deer, red stag, basically everything you can hunt in Europe. For me, the best all-around cartridge. So my question is, have you ever heard about a 7x64 AI? Would this be possible or would it add any advantage at all? Thanks for your feedback and happy Easter. Well, Wolfgang, the 764 AI I have not heard of, um, but it makes perfect sense. The 7x64 preceded the 280 Remington and it, they almost look identical. The 7x64 is actually a little bit bigger. So you're going to get similar ballistics out of it. It also, I think, has a higher a maximum average chamber pressure, so you'll get a little more velocity out of it. Now, the AI stands for Ackley Improved, and that simply means you take any cartridge and you sort of maximize the um, walls of the case to be as straight as they can be, just minimize the taper, and then sharpen the shoulder to 40 degrees. And that increases internal um, volume a little bit, so you get more velocity, but the biggest advantage is that you reduce the need for neck trimming if you're a hand loader. As your cartridge gets resized again and again and reshot, the brass tends to stretch and it flows up into the neck and the neck gets a little too long, you have to trim some off. Not the most pleasant task in the, in the world, so those of us with AI cartridges know that that 40 degree shoulder helps slow down some of that stretching so we don't, we don't trim as much. And the cases seem to last a little bit longer. So that's the advantage there. And I have not heard of anyone making a 7x64 AI, but it would surely be possible. And one place you could look um, are the, um, the manufacturers who make reloading dies, hand loading dies. They will usually have a long list of custom dies that people have ordered in the past, and they'll be able to make those for you. Check that list and see if they don't have some 7x64 AIs already on the list. And then your next option would be to just contact them and say, hey, can you make me one? And I think they would probably be able to. All right. Mike. This is another patron. Mike says, I am completing a build of a 280 Ackley improved. And the question of twist rate is puzzling. What is the best twist rate to use if I want to use midweight copper bullets for long range hunting and heavyweight bullets for caliber uh, for woodland hunts? My current choice is a 5R rifling, 24 inch barrel, 1 and 8 twist. Mike, that's just fine. Um, your 1 and 8 twist will be needed if you decide to shoot some of the really long VLD type bullets, uh, 180 grains up to 190. I think they've even got one up at around 195 now. But these really long high BC bullets are quite effective for minimizing wind deflection at longer ranges. You say you're going to hunt in the woodlands where you really don't need that type of bullet. Your standard 160 to 175 grain seven millimeter bullets in a controlled expansion format are going to work just fine for your woodland hunts where you're probably not shooting 200 yards till you get past 300 perhaps even 400 you really don't need those high bc bullets but hey it never hurts to use them because you always get more on target energy from an efficient aerodynamically shaped bullet but yeah, your one and eight twist will be just fine. Now, if you're concerned about overstabilization of your lighter bullets, I wouldn't freak out about it. That's really not a problem unless you're shooting bench rest precision. Um, in that case, they want to use flat based bullets and minimal twist to stabilize them. They want them fully stabilized, but not overly stabilized. They just seem to be a touch more accurate that way. Now we're talking 
tenth of an inch kind of accuracy here. It doesn't really apply to a hunting cartridge or rifle. And then if you're not using highly frangible bullets, you don't have to worry about this spinning apart business that sometimes happens with really fast twist barrels and thinly jacketed soft lead core bullets. They will literally get torn apart by that fast rifling twist. But I shoot oh, 120, 130 grain copper bullets in my sevens really, really fast. There's nothing to spin apart with those and they shoot beautifully. So I think you're going to do just fine with your one and eight twist. If you're a little bit worried about it, you want to compromise, look for an eight and a half. But I have found that the nine inch twist really does the job for me up to 175 grain bullets. Now we've got what the team pulled up and they told me that they have a long list on here and they hope that I can answer them. So let's find out what they've got. Christopher from Arizona. Welcome, Christopher. What have you got to ask me here? Compare these bullets for a 7mm 08. Uh, one, a Hammer Hunter, 146 grain. A Barnes LRX, 145 grains. A Barnes TTSX, 150 grain. Or a more traditional Nosler Partition, 150 grain. Normal Whitetail, 150 grain. Oh my gosh. For ranges under 300 yards. They all will work. I'm sorry if you don't like the 7mm 08. I picked it because these bullets are pretty similar in size. My rifle's twist rate is one eight and a half. It's an eight and a half inch twist. It's an adequate for all of them. Well, I don't know, Christopher, that you're really asking me a question. It sounds like you're just stating reality here and what's working for you. Um, compare the bullets. I don't know if you mean you want me to compare the performance of those bullets. I've had some experience with Hammer Hunter bullets, but not this 146 grain bullet. I have used a lot of the Barnes LRX bullets as well as their TTSX. And all of those copper bullets have performed beautifully for me. And I've used them extensively on a wide variety of game. Nothing bad to say about them. Obviously, the lighter specific density of that material, copper, it means you're going to have for the same length bullet, less sectional density. Um, but again, the construction makes up for it. Um, and you're not going to have as high of BC. You want to get your BCs really, really high. It helps to have a denser material in your bullet. It's not just the shape. It is the density of the material. So, but again, those 150s, I've used the Barnes uh, TSX, TTSX types in 150 for elk, caribou, moose. Um, uh, I think that Hammer Hunter is going to do really well for you. I've just had great success with those over in Africa. So, I think you've nailed them. Now, I'm not familiar with this normal whitetail 150 grain range or whatever it is. Oh, your range for shooting it is under 300 yards is what you mean. Um, gosh, yeah, you're going to do fine. The Norma, I can't comment on. Not familiar with that one. But boy, the rest of them. Your nozzle partition will have your lowest SD or your lowest BC of all of these. But that is a, a proven performer right there. That one really does well. So I can't argue against any of them. All right, Jonathan from Oregon. Hello, Ron. I have recently decided to go down the rabbit hole of forgotten cartridges. Is the 284 Winchester, oh no, the 284 Win Mag, you must mean Winchester because there's no 284 Win Mag, just a watered down 7 millimeter Remington Magnum. So assuming you mean the 284 Winchester, which is not a Magnum, is it a watered down 7 mm? Not really. What they did, what Winchester did when they made the 284 Winchester was they wanted a short action cartridge to work in their lever action and auto loading action rifles. The new ones they came out with in around 1964, I think it was. One was a Model 88, the other was a Model 100. They wanted a short action to do the same thing that a 270 would do in those rifles. That's why they made the 284. They weren't thinking of competing with the 7 Rem Mag on this one. And they pretty much succeeded. That uh, 284 will pretty closely duplicate what a 270 does with similar weight bullets. I find it easier to compare the 284 Winchester with the 280 Remington. And that might be what they were possibly thinking of overdoing or outcompeting with their short action version. Um, and then the other consideration these days would be the 7 millimeter 08, which didn't come out until 
1980, but that one is pretty close in performance to the 284. 284 will exceed it if you hand load. Just not a lot of ammo out there from the manufacturers, unfortunately. I just love that 284 Winchester. I think just an optimum little short action cartridge. One of the first short fats really, and it really hangs in there. I don't know how much longer it'll keep going, but I hope it, it's got some more life in it. All right, let's go to Washington where Spencer asks uh, about some, wow, a six millimeter Dasher and a seven millimeter PRS. I don't even know these all that well. I've never shot either one of them. I'm afraid I'm just gonna have to defer to our listeners. Somebody fill me in on the seven millimeter Dasher. I hear a lot about it, have not dived into it. And the seven millimeter PRS sounds to me like it is a wildcat. Unless you meant the PRC. If you mean PRC, yeah, that's the new hot seven millimeter from Hornady that I think is going to take over from the seven rem mag. I have already called it the seven millimeter Remington Magnum of the 21st century. So if that's the one you mean, yeah, that one I can get fully behind. I'm probably not going to get one myself because I've got so many rifles already and I've got some wonderful 7mm Remington Magnums that are doing the job for me. So I think I'm going to skip the PRC and let you younger guys tackle that one. But if I were 20, 25, even 30 years old and starting my, my big game hunting career and I had my options these days, I think I'd roll with that 7 PRC. But if there's a PRS out there, sounds to me like it might be some short action for the PRS type uh, long range shooting competition. So again, someone's going to have to fill me in on that one. All right, Alabama, Hunter in Alabama. Hey, Ron, I love the videos. I have learned a lot from them. My question is, what is a good seven millimeter Magnum that's not too expensive, but good quality for hunting whitetail? I've heard great things about them and I'm thinking of getting one. Well, I think you mean the seven millimeter Remington Magnum. You're asking about the rifles rather than the different Magnum cartridges, right? Because there's a seven Weatherby mag, the Remington mag, the short mag, the short um, SOM, the short action ultra mag from Remington. And uh, what else? We've got the 28 Nosler, which is not called Magnum, but it essentially is the Remington ultra Magnum seven, the big, long, full Magnum length one. Wow. Lots of cartridges. So I'm guessing that you mean by 7 mag, the Remington Magnum. And now you want to know what rifle to put it in, right? Oh, man. <laughs> Sky's the limit. There are so many out there. I don't think you can go wrong. It, the same rifles that do well in 30 at 6 and 270 and 300 wind mag and all the different chamberings, the basic rifle is the same regardless what you chamber it for. So it's not going to be that the Remington or the Mossberg or the Savage or the Ruger or any of the other brands chambered in 7 rem mag are going to be different. It's the rifle itself you want to study and figure out. Do you want a controlled feed action? Do you want the push feed action? Do you uh, want maybe even a lever action? I think I think that Browning's BLR comes in a 7 rem mag. So you will have to decide on what rifle action you like. Most of them are fairly similar these days and built to the same quality levels until you get into the semi-custom custom ones where they really fine tune everything and get all of their tolerances really tight and you start paying top dollar for the kind of precision you can expect out of those for target shooting. But for general purpose hunting, golly, you can get four, five, six hundred dollar rifles these days that right out of the box with factory ammunition will shoot minute of angle which is more than good enough for 99.99% of all big game hunting you're ever going to want to do. So good luck on picking those. I am just don't, as you can imagine, have the time to go into all the details of all the different types of actions out there. All right, let's see what's coming out of Utah. Preston, Mr. Spomer, hmm, Mrs. Goody has got some respect showed to me here. I really like that, boys. <laughs> Mr. Spomer, I have been looking to upgrade to a do-it-all cartridge for hunting large game, and I have narrowed my options down to the 7 Rem Mag or the 7 PRC. <laughs> these two are battling it out these days. My situation is different from most hunters. About 13 years ago, fate dealt me a hand that left me in a wheelchair for life. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Preston. Um, but with the help of family and some very generous property owners here in Utah, I've been able to harvest some decent mule deer over the years. 
but it's getting hard to find a uh, private property. Landowners are selling things off and I'm forced to go onto public land, which is not too bad, except I'm having to take longer shots on animals. No matter how much I love my Creedmoor, 6.5 Creedmoor, I just don't trust it. It ranges over 300 to maybe 400 yards. So my question is, is there a greater benefit in having a 7 PRC over the <clears throat> 7 millimeter Remington Magnum at ranges between 400 and 800 yards? Would love your thoughts. Thanks for all you do. Oh, boy, this is a tough one, Preston. First of all, I'm sorry for your condition, but I praise you for getting back out there, getting back in the saddle, so to speak, and making the best of it. I've uh, known some uh, wheelchair-bound hunters who have done a great job and had some wonderful success. It sounds like you're having some yourself. But I'm not so sure you should be shooting past 400 yards unless you have someone there who can back you up and or find that animal for you. Uh, I don't know about Utah, but up here in Idaho, some 800 yard shots would put me with two good legs an awfully long way away from that animal. So I'd be worried about the recovery. And if there's a wounded animal situation, I don't know. I'm just cautioning you a little bit here. Uh, you want to might, might want to take care, but if you are thinking of some extended range shooting, I think your seven millimeter PRC is the easy choice over the seven rem mag. Reason being, they come with the fast twist barrels, one and eight, one and eight and a half maybe. And the ammunition is pretty much geared up for the high BC long reach bullets. So you're going to have an instant advantage. Yes, as a hand loader, you can work with the seven rem mag and use those bullets. But there's a few tricks you have to use to get her to be as easy as buying that seven PRC. You just, you buy the rifle, you put the scope on it, you buy your ammo. If it's shooting well, you practice, you train, and you're ready to go. So unless you're a hand loader, I think I would go with the seven millimeter PRC. And good luck to you. Uh, let me know after next fall season how you do. Be uh, fun to hear that you've taken your good one with your new rifle. Hello, everyone. I would like to introduce you to our knife of the month from Diamond Blade Knives, our sponsor. It's the Little Alpha. Isn't that a cute little knife? But deadly. This thing is really well designed. As you can see, it's a really small blade, two and three quarter inches of blade, but really there's two inches of cutting surface. And notice that nice belly makes it a versatile knife. I like a drop point and you've got a real tapered spine on it. So it gets narrower towards the tip. And that allows you to do some really fine work when you're cutting your pattern initially. And then you use the belly of that knife for skinning. And for real detailed work, you've got some good grip options here. First of all, the scales on the handle are sure grip, kind of a rubberized material that does not slip. And then you've got your bolster here. So you can put your thumb up on the gimping on the back of the spine right there and do some close work and really control that blade. And if you really want to do fine work, you will notice there's this gimping right up uh, near the tip. So you can just direct that tip so precisely with a blade like this. Full tang, obviously, for strength. And of course, it's got the diamond blade material and sharpness, something like 10 times sharper than the next sharpest blade knife you can get as far as durability. It will really hold an edge. Full-time, lifetime warranty on this. They will sharpen it for you for free if you think you need to have it sharpened by them. I find that they sharpen very easily just with the standard techniques that I've used all my life on knives, they just last a lot longer after you've gotten them sharp. So if you're looking for a really nice knife for general uh, hunting use for, let's say, white tails and smaller animals, I think that's plenty of blade. This thing only weighs 2.2 ounces. The nice sheath here is 2.3 ounces. And I like this sheath in that you've got this release on the back. You can slide it over your belt and close it into position without having to take your belt off. And the blade is perfectly protected by this plastic nylon material. I'm not sure what they call it, but it's a plastic nylon material. <laughs> now we're going to go over to Maine with Robert. Sir, I have a 7mm Remington Magnum hunting rifle. I do not use it for hunting because when I fire the rifle, I cannot get the brass to come out for several minutes until it cools off. Wow, that's strange. I have had several gunsmiths look at it, and I've, they, I've sent it back to Remington, and it still won't eject a hot round for several minutes unless I put a rod down the muzzle. Wow. 
I have bent it, worked on it, and frigged with that objector for years and no success. Does anyone have any ideas how I might fix this thing? The ejector is just that simple metal ring with a hook on it that's clipped to the bolt face. Yeah, I know that. I use this gun for long distance shots only when I have time to reload. And I always carry a second rifle for my primary game taker. Yeah, I would too. Thanks. Um, Bob from Central Maine. Um, by the way, I live so far in the woods that I have to go towards town to hunt. <laughs> That's pretty clever. Well, Bob, this is strange. And the only thing I can think of, and I can't imagine why either Remington or these gunsmiths didn't catch it, but one issue is you might have a ring in the front of the, the throat of your case, right at the mouth. A carbon ring could have built up and that could be, your necks are a little bit long. They could be impacting that ring and then they swell and grab a hold of it. More likely though, is some sort of a catch in the chambering. Uh, if there was a piece of metal sticking up. So imagine your case, it's in the chamber and there's a protrusion of some kind in there. It doesn't have to be really a lot. And you get the swelling of the case from the expansion of the gases when it's hot. And then that's hooked in there. It's sort of almost melded or blown into it. And that's why you have to wait quite a while to cool down. And it could be a very small imperfection too. If it cools and then it comes out, that suggests to me and it's not real significant, but it's just enough to give it that extra tension. That's what I would have looked at. I would think somebody could go in there with a reamer and clean that up. But if you can get a bore scope to look down in there, really magnified, and just run down the chamber and look for any little imperfections, and then out there at the throat where the neck of your case would sit, look for a buildup of carbon. And if you find that, a black ring of some kind out there, you get in there with some solvents and you're going to have to really scrub to get that out because that can just be baked in over shot after shot after shot. So you're going to have to do some serious work to get that scrubbed out. But that's where I would look. That's my best bet. I'm just surprised that some gunsmith couldn't figure it out. Well, let's try Mom. Mitchell, it looks like, in Nova Scotia. He's just north of Maine. Hi, Ron. Mitchell here from Nova Scotia, sure enough. Uh, I love listening to your podcasts. I listen to them while at work. Better them than the music that they make today. <laughs> Appreciate that, Michael, Mitchell. Lots of laughs. I have a question regarding twist rate versus bullet length. I'm having a hard time trying to understand it all. Now, I have a Browning X-Bolt 7 Rem Mag, and I believe the twist rate is 9.5. That's pretty standard. We have an absolute horrible time finding ammo up here for popular calibers, let alone out of the norm calibers like the Magnums. I have access to two brands of ammo, one being Remington Core Lock, I'm not a fan, and the other being Federal Premium loaded with a Barnes TSX bullet, muzzle velocity of 2,940 feet per second, the bullet length of 1.405 inch, and a BC rating of 0.392. My question may be a simple one for you, but is my twist rate fast enough to successfully stabilize these bullets? I have a 30 out 6 for black bear and whitetail hunting, and I've taken moose with it, but I couldn't pass up this deal on the 7 millimeter for hopeful future moose hunts. So thanks again, and always hunt honest and shoot straight. And yeah, thanks for that, Mitchell. Okay, so you've got a TSX bullet. That's going to stabilize just fine in that 9.5. Not a problem at all. Now, any of you wondering about stability on bullets, you understand, of course, it's the length of the bullet, not the weight. Weight becomes an issue because as you get a longer bullet, it's going to weigh more. But it's the length that requires faster twist to stabilize. Burger Bullets has a beautiful resource online. Go to burgerbullets.com and go to their stabilization, twist stabilization calculator. And they have the slots in there that you fill in with your data, like how long is a bullet, what's the BC of the bullet, what's your muzzle velocity, all these details that they need to give you the effective stabilization of that particular bullet. And bingo, you put it in there and it'll tell you if it's going to be stable or not. Really pretty simple. But just knowing what you're talking about here with this 1.405 length and a BC of 392, that looks uh, sounds to me about like 140, 145 grain bullet in a copper your TSX, and those will easily stabilize in a nine and a half twist. They always have in mind anyway, so go for it. 
And that's a better bullet for for a moose hunt or a caribou hunt than I think the uh, the uh, Remington Corlock you had there. That would be a good one for a broadside shot on a whitetail, taking them down fast. But the bigger stuff, yeah, you need that premium bullet. All right, Brad in, oh, he's in Idaho, Middleton. Been there many times, Brad. Dear Mr. Spomer, I own a, here we go again, Remington 7 millimeter. That is such a popular cartridge. The Remington 7 Rem mag, and I have taken deer, elk, and black bear with it. I was talking to someone at the gun range one day, and they stated that the 7 millimeter Remington Magnum was not actually a Magnum cartridge. Whoa. <laughs> Is this a true statement? <laughs> no, <laughs> it might have been true to that guy, but it's not true to me. Or the company that named it the 7 Remington Magnum, hint, hint. I also remember that that guy said that the 270 Winchester should be considered a Magnum cartridge. Is what he stated true? No, <laughs> not. It's not like some old wives' tales to me, if you can still say that in this day and age. Uh, you could also say it sounded like some gossip from the fourth bar stool to the left or something like that. I don't know. But these tales get told and over and over again, and it's kind of silly. The 270 Winchester doesn't have nearly enough powder capacity to be considered a Magnum. A Magnum is considered an, a, a higher volume of powder for a particular uh, caliber and or case size. So the 30 out six is a perfect example. That's kind of become a standard. Comes out in 1906. It's used in the world wars and everybody knows it. Pretty fast, powerful cartridge. If you want a more powerful cartridge with more powder, you're talking 300 Weatherby Magnum, 300 Winchester Magnum on up. You call those Magnums because they're more powerful than the standard. Well, the 270 was the first 270 in the country based on a 30 out six case. So bingo, it's a standard. And the 270 Weatherby Magnum is the Magnum. Same with the sevens. The 280 Remington comes out in 1958. That's your 280. Same case as the 270, the 30 out six, basically. Remington comes out with a larger diameter case with a belt on it, the 300 H&H &H neck down. And it's a seven millimeter Remington Magnum. There's your clue. <laughs> Yeah, so now you know what to tell that guy next time you see him out at the range. Now, I can appreciate his appreciation for the 270 because it is a great performer, but it's not a Magnum. Not coming anywhere close to the 270 Weatherby Mag. All right, let's drop down to Mississippi. Brett. Ron, I love your videos. I appreciate that, Brett. I appreciate all of you guys who tell me that you love my videos. Never hesitate to pat me on the back because I desperately need it. <laughs> I love your video. So my question is regarding a seven millimeter WSM. Hallelujah. We got a different one in here. I own a couple of seven WSMs as well as a couple of the seven Remington Magnum. I hand load for both. To be honest, I've never met a deer in Mississippi that knew a difference between the two. <laughs> yeah, I believe that. However, I personally have seen better deer sized game performance shooting 139 grain bullets in the WSM versus the standard Magnum. Huh. Similar recoil. I notice it less with the WSM and it's a shorter action. Not like that. And I have shot the Hornady Boattail Spire Point, the Hornady SST and the Hornady GMX bullets with tremendous success in both or all of them. But it's, oh, I think he means in both rifles, the 7 Rem Mag and a 7 WSM. But it's almost always better in the WSM. Well, okay. So Brett is pretty much selling that seven millimeter Winchester short Magnum. Now here's his question. Why do you think the WSM has fallen away? I see the 270 WSM and the 300 WSM on the shelves, but never the seven WSM. I also own a 25 WSSM, but that is a deer killing machine and another question for another time. So I need to talk to him about the seven millimeter WSM and why it failed. And that is a darn good question. I wonder the same thing. I know why the 300 and 270 took off and are still around. The 300 was the first one out and it pretty much does what the 300 Win Mag does in the short fat case, the way it was promoted. And the 270 WSM I think did really well because it's a significant step down in caliber size, plus their Winchesters and the 270 Winchester, it's just Winchester. Everybody knows it. When they see 270, they automatically think Winchester. When they see 7 millimeter, 
That doesn't really say Winchester. It says Remington, it says Mauser, uh, it says a lot of things these days, but Winchester was really never into making seven millimeters, except for that 284. So, and then they called it the 284, and that for most people doesn't mean ring the seven millimeter bell. So I think that's what it was. When they had your choices, gosh, are you going to get the new WSM? Yeah, which one, the 300 or the 270? Not many people thought of the seven. So they didn't sell well, so they sort of faded away. That's my take on it. But I agree with you that it is one heck of a performer. Um, and it doesn't surprise me that you're doing as well as or slightly better than the 7 Rem Mag. Um, it's just too bad more people aren't shooting it. Now, I have noticed that a lot of the long range shooters are working with it. I heard from a fan just the other day who had just building a rifle for the 7 WSM or had just built it and was working up loads for it. And this gentleman has played with just about every 7 and 6.5 millimeter you can think of to shoot as far as 2,000 yards. I think these days he's going even farther. And he has tried them all and he says he's liking this WSM-7 better than all the rest of them. So that's encouraging news. Maybe it'll have a little comeback. Well, let's drop down into the heart of Texas where Chuck is writing us. Hello, Ron, I love your videos. Another one. I have a couple of questions for you. I recently came across a custom Remington 700 that was converted from a right-handed rifle to a left-handed in a cartridge that I'd never heard of before. Seven millimeter STW. That stands for Shooting Times Westerner. After a conversation with my dad about it, I called the store and I bought the rifle. I was told also that that rifle had potential to have been owned by Charles Askins. From my quick Google search, I learned that he was a gun writer in Jack O'Connor's time. I was wondering if you could go a little more into depth on the 7mm STW and Mr. Askins. Love your podcast and your YouTube videos, and I'm, I love learning about new and old and odd and interesting cartridges, and I love the way you explain them. Well, thank you so much for that, Chuck. Let me see if I can explain the 7 STW and the prickly Mr. Askins. <laughs> Let's start with the uh, 7 STW. That was created in 1998, I believe, was when it was officially released. Um, Ah, oh, who made that? Lane Simpson. He just took the eight millimeter Remington Magnum. That's a full length cartridge um, for a Magnum. And he just necked it down to seven and bingo. It was at that time the fastest seven. It's been now been superseded by the 28 Nosler and the rum, the seven rum. And I think it's going to fade away because it's fairly long and skinny. It's based on the 375 H&H &H case with the belt. And these days, everybody wants to get rid of the belt. Um, and they want short actions and all the rest. And the, I think the biggest competition for it is the 28 Nosler. That one's kind of the top dog of the big ones. The 7 Realm Remington Ultra Magnum is not as popular as I've seen as the uh, 28 Nosler. But both of those are faster than the STW and they don't have the belt. So now Askins. Colonel Charles Askins, born in the early 1900s, a military man, uh, worked for the Border Patrol and uh, did a lot of, oh gosh, he was in World War II in the Pacific, I believe. He was quite a shooter. He, he was a pistol instructor, I believe, for the Border Patrol and a real irascible person from what I've read and what I've heard from some of the old timers who had bumped into him and known him. Pretty prickly guy, my way or the highway kind of a guy. Um, he was a pistol shooting champ. He won a lot of shooting competitions. He just shot and shot and shot. Uh, if you want to read a book, gosh, he wrote some, wrote several books. He was writing for the NRA, American Rifleman, a lot of hunting and shooting and gun magazines in the day. So there's a lot of material out there. You might want to check that out. But the chances of him having owned this rifle, I think are absolutely zero because he died, I think in, gosh, he was in his nineties. And if he was born in the early 1900s, he probably died in the late a, late 90s because I know he was into his 90s. So he probably was yeah, 90 years old when this thing came out. Now he's going to have a, a rifle magnum commissioned left-handed. And I don't even know if he was left-handed. I think he was left-handed. But 
he wouldn't have still been shooting in his 90s when this thing came out. And by then, most old guys, I can speak from experience here, uh, we sort of use the rifles that we've known and loved for the last 30 or 40 years. <laughs> we don't generally jump on the latest train to come through the station. So I doubt that yeah, the Charles Askins got the uh, ownership of that rifle at any time. So I wouldn't spend extra money on the chance that he owned it. <laughs> But hey, good luck with that. I mean, the the cartridge is still capable of doing everything it always did do. It's just not as popular anymore now that these other Magnums have come out. All right, now we're going to back to Canada. Again, we were up in Nova Scotia. Now we're going to go to Manitoba where Kyle asks us something. Ron, I recently picked up a Remington Model 700 chambered in the, oh, it's another seven millimeter STW. How do you like that? After doing very little research on the cartridge, I quickly discovered it was a hand loader special. You got that right. So I recently got into hand loading to fuel this rifle. Now, my local sporting goods store is quite small. The only bullets I could find for the thing are 139 grain Hornady GMX. Do you think they will be sufficient for an elk? Yes, I do. If I get drawn this year. Oh, if he gets drawn this year. Yeah, I hope you get drawn this year. And yes, not the greatest bullet for an elk, but I used a 139 grain all copper bullet last year for my big bull. It was a Barnes bullet, 139, but not the Hornady, but the GMX. I've used it on uh, red stag and feral pigs and stuff and gotten good performance out of it. It's been around a long time. They have a better one now, the CX. They made a few improvements on it, but I think you're going to do just fine with that. That bullet's going to retain almost all of its weight hitting that elk should get deep penetration on it just put it in the right place i think you'll do fine he continues i also have a tika in the 300 wsm i thought it would be cool to harvest a draw only animal with ammunition that i made from a not so common round thanks p.s keep up the great work i never miss a podcast well great kyle great glad to have you listening in yeah i think you'll do okay with that hornady gmx you've got a little time now so shop around maybe you'll, you'll stumble onto something else but like i say the, the 139 all copper bullets have worked well for me out of a seven rem mag and you've got an stw you'll be able to <laughs> really smoke that thing and i think the velocity will more than make up for it and you don't have to worry about that high velocity on impact breaking up your bullet like you do with some of the lead core bullets it's going to stay in one piece and really hammer him i think you're going to do well with it all right stefan from california hi ron kind of new to this channel but i was curious if you can talk about the history of remington with the the, the the development of the 280, oh, which I have, and I like it a lot. Okay, he wants me to compare the 280 to the 7 Rem Mag. Didn't Remington come out with the 7 millimeter after? And if so, why? Did they realize they could get more performance out of the same bullets? Was it new technology? I'm just wondering what that thought process was when they developed those. Good question, Stefan. And here's how it came down. The Remington 280 was based off of the 30 out 6 and Remington wanted to compete against the 270 Winchester. Real similar. Obviously, one's a 277 bullet and the other one should say 284 bullet. So they cranked that thing out in 1958. They made the mistake of getting it registered with a fairly low maximum average chamber pressure. They didn't need to do that. The rifles could handle more pressure, but they wanted to put it in... Uh, their pump action rifle, and I think later they were eyeballing their auto loading rifle, or maybe they initially put it in their auto loading. One was the 7600 or the 760, and the other was the 740. And they uh, probably were a little concerned about being able to contain the pressures with those kinds of actions. So they kept the pressures down. Well, shoot, that kind of cost it the, the whole competition because that 270 Winchester is allowed 65,000 psi slide on down to 58,000 for the 280. And that's its biggest fault. Now, hand loaders have since learned that you can push the pressures up because the cases are pretty much the same deal. The rifles are the same deal. You could have that same Remington rifle chambered for the 270 Winchester and it's fine. Why not get your pressures up in the 280? And that's what hand loaders will carefully do. And I emphasize carefully, work your way up slowly, guys, and look for those pressure signs. But the 7 Rem Mag was a whole different program because they knew that the uh, Magnums, the belted Magnums, were really taking off. Uh, Weatherby had a whole bunch of them, obviously. He was the king of velocity. 
and Remington was seeing the writing on the wall. This was post-World War II, and everybody was going faster and faster. Rocket ships were flying off, and we were starting to do the space race and all this wonderful stuff. So in 1962, Remington was coming out with a brand new rifle, the Model 700. Prior to that, it was a 721 and a 722. They made some improvements on that and came out with this new rifle, and they probably thought, guys, if we're going to have a new rifle, why don't we include a new cartridge? Something really super duper, faster than ever, huh? A Magnum. Winchester's got a 264 Winchester Magnum. Why don't we do a seven millimeter Magnum? Yeah, let's do that. They weren't worried about the bullets because there were plenty of sevens around. The seven Mauser had the same bullets and the Europeans mostly had those 0.284 bullets, seven millimeters. So Remington was just trying to come up with something new that would catch the shooter's eyes. And boy, did they ever catch them. That thing took off like a rocket. The Model 700 rifle was less expensive than the Model 70 Winchester, which was its major competition at the time. Uh, so it was savings there. And then you had a cartridge that outperformed the 264. And bingo, you could shoot heavier bullets in it. If the 264 was really fast and flat with 140 grain bullets, while well, the seven rim mag would match it with 160 grain bullet. And if you wanted 175 grain, you could get that. And now you're talking big elk and moose. So a lot more versatile cartridge. So the 280 kind of mm, faded away. It never really took off. People who shot it loved it. And it is a great cartridge, especially if you hand load. But the seven rim mag, it had everything from the start. 65,000 PSI, I think, is its pressures. So it was sailing from the get-go. Now, something interesting about that 280 is that they later came out with a new name for it. Same cartridge, they were going to call it the 7mm Ot 6 because it had been around with that name on it as a Wildcat cartridge for quite a while. Remington just chose 280 for it when they decided to legitimize it. But since it kind of fell flat, they thought, why don't we bring it back out and we'll call it what people wanted in the first place, 706. And then they thought better of it at the last minute, and decided not to do that, but they still needed a new name. We need something snazzy to catch their attention. Let's call it the Express. Yeah, the 7 millimeter Express. Perfect. It'll sound really fast and people will buy it. Well, people bought it all right, but then they tried to put it in their 7 rem mag rifles and they went, why isn't this working? <laughs> It created a confusion that they had to finally correct by withdrawing the name after a couple of years and renaming it the 280 Remington. Such a sad story for a, what could have been a great cartridge. All right. Great question there, Stefan. This is uh, Darren in Ohio. I'm buying my first rifle next month, and I'm wondering if the 7 millimeter PRC would be a good caliber for my first rifle. I plan on hunting whitetails, mule deer, bear, elk, and moose. Hey, why stop there, Darren? You haven't gone to Africa yet. <laughs> All right, I'm with you on this one. I don't think the 7 PRC would be the perfect first rifle for anybody. Um, but if you can learn to shoot without flinching, I think you can do just well. I mean, it's a great pick for an all-around rifle. Don't get me wrong. I just think that as a learner, you're better off with a lighter recoiling rifle. I always encourage people to start with a 243 Winchester or something in that category, six millimeter Creedmoor. Um, you could even step down to the 22s. I would recommend a 223 because it's ubiquitous. Ammunition is inexpensive and abundant. You can get a fairly inexpensive rifle for it and use it for a training rifle. Um, save a lot of expense by shooting that instead of your big rifle. And then after you've really learned to shoot well, good trigger control, no flinching or any of that, you can step up to something like a seven. So here's the caveat. I would say, yes, the seven PRC is a great all around rifle for hunting everything you mentioned and more, but try to get a lighter recoiling rifle to get up to speed before you start shooting that seven. Now, if you do is don't have the wherewithal to buy two rifles and you just get one, you could do it. But I would have some experienced shooter help you out uh, with the recoil. It's not brutal recoil, but most people, when they're new to it, they just, yeah, it's all new. And it, I, I think it kicks. It doesn't bother older shooters who've been around and handled some really big stuff. So get some good protection on your shoulder, hearing protection for sure. And 
really work on not flinching when you shoot that thing. And you do that, and I think you ought to be able to handle it pretty quickly, pretty effectively. All right, Garrett from Colorado. Ron, I have a question about reloading new cartridge as specifically, here we go again, the seven millimeter PRC. I am new to reloading, so this might be a silly question for an experienced hand loader. I would like to work up a load using the nozzle 175 grain Acubond long range bullet, but they have not published load data for any bullet besides their 185 RDF for the seven PRC. My question is, can I use the load data published by Hornady on their 175 grain ELDX bullet as a starting point and be considered safe? I have heard different bullets will behave differently in the barrel and can cause differences in pressures. So I want to make sure I'm not going to blow up my brand new rifle. Thanks for your help and keep up the great podcast. All right. No, I don't think you're going to blow up your rifle by switching to bullets like that. Yes, there are some bullets, especially the older uh, first generation all copper bullets. They were fairly hard and they had long shanks and fairly sticky material like copper. It's a little stickier against the rifling than the uh, gilding metal jackets on traditional bullets. So there was some concern about the pressures there, but they've been relieved with the relief grooves around the shanks on most of those bullets. So all you really need to do with that weight is just use a starting load. All of these magazines or hand loading manuals will say 175 grain bullet, starting load with this much powder and your velocity is like 2,600 feet per second, when the peak load might be 2,900 feet per second. So you know you've really downloaded that thing. Your pressures will be quite a bit lower. That's how you start off with your hand loads. It's not so much the bullet as keeping your powder in primers down there. Um, use what the book says on a primer. So some primers will cause more pressure than others. And then use their starting load and watch for pressure signs as you increase, as you go up. If you've got a chronograph, so much the better, because then you can say, oh, yeah, I'm only getting not if the book says I should get 26 and I'm only getting 25. So, wow, I'll put another grain in, see what I get. And you should see the progression, 25, 25, 50, 26, 26, 75, however it moves up the scale. Every grain of powder, you're getting a little bit faster. Your pressures are going up to get that done. So watch your cases when you extract, when you open that bolt and pull back. Did the bolt lift up hard as if things were stuck in the chamber? That could suggest too much pressure. Once you bring it back, look at the primer. Is it uh, blackened around the edges? That means there's so much pressure in there, the gas is starting to leak out the cracks. <laughs> um, and then is the primer protruding a little bit? That could be a bad sign of high pressure, could be an issue with your headspace. And then is the crater in the primer where your firing pin hits it? If the firing pin hits and there's a lot of pressure in there, the metal of the primer itself will flow around like the rim of a crater around that firing pin. And that's a high pressure sign. Those are some of the things you need to look for when you're hand loading for pressures. But otherwise, yeah, it's all you need to do and you'll be fine. All right, we're getting near the end here. I think Jason might just finish it off for us today. And he is down in Mississippi. Will a seven millimeter Remington Magnum and a seven millimeter PRC kill a brown bear pretty easily? <laughs> if so, which is the maximum killing range for them? And which is the better cartridge for brown bears? Yes, with the right bullet in the right place, both of those will do fine. I have talked with some master guide brown bear hunters. They generally like a bigger bullet, a 338 wind mag and up. But they've also recognized that over the years, a good shooter with the right bullet in a 30 out six does just as well. That what they tell me is that the bears properly hit die just as fast when they're hit with a 30 out six, sometimes even a 308, as they are with the 338 or the 375 H&Hs. The advantage you get with the bigger ones, of course, is a bigger bullet. So if you've got a bit of a fringe hit, you might be more successful. And if you really need to drive deep with that more massive, heavy bullet, you can do that. But for hunting, you're going to be backed up by a guide. So if there's a charge, she'll probably have a bigger gun to do that work. You just need to get a good killing shot into the boiler room, as we say. So either one of those will do the job. And I can't say that the PRC is going to be better than the seven rem mag unless it's a fairly long shot. And I don't recommend long shots on bears nor do the guides and outfitters up there. Just because it's such a big animal and you sometimes have to shoot them two or three times, 
Maybe make a long shot and he gets into cover. And there's a lot of alder thickets and stuff up there. You can't get another shot into it. So they like generally to get you a lot closer than 300 yards. So there's not a huge advantage to the PRC. But the PRC will more easily shoot bigger, longer, heavier bullets. 180 grain instead of 175. But there are not a lot of 180 grain bullets that are controlled expansion hunting bullets yet. They're good for elk and probably moose and deer and such. But you want to look at a controlled expansion bullet that that's heavy like that. You're probably going to have a little trouble finding them yet in that 7 millimeter 180 grain range where you can take advantage of the faster twist in the PRC. So if you can find a 180 grain controlled expansion bullet, the PRC will do better just because the longer, sleeker, higher BC bullet will be aerodynamically efficient and it will carry more energy at all distances downrange. But it's a relatively minor concern. They're so close, I wouldn't freak out about either one of them. I would gladly take my 7 rem mag, a good 175 grain style partition style bullet, swift A-frame, um, or a heavier all copper bullet and should do just fine. So, boy, that's my take on the 7 millimeter. Now, before I sign off, I think it behooves me to say, buy my book. <laughs> if you guys want more details about the seven millimeter, this is the place to get it. We've got 46 different cartridges in here. We give some history on them, some of their ballistic performance. We've got this nice little chart in the back, the chronological development of all the seven millimeter cartridges over time. That's kind of fun. First one came out in 1892. The most recent one came out in 2023. But there are a lot of them in between there. Some of them are obscure. You've probably never heard of them before. Some of them may come back. Some of them are really fun to play around with. If you want to know all about 7 millimeters, this is the place to find it. You can get this book from Amazon or you can go to ronspomeroutdoors.com, our website, go to the store and buy an autographed copy there. Would love to sell one to you guys. And if you don't love 7 millimeters, hang in there. I'm working on a 30 caliber book. It's time for comment of the week. And the comment winner is from Utah. It's Preston. This is the gentleman who is in a wheelchair and still hunting. And I always like folks who stick to it like that. As I said in the session, climb back in the saddle and get back to it. So I commend you, sir, for sticking to it and getting involved, staying involved, staying active and staying outdoors and getting the most for your money. We really appreciate it. Thanks for writing in and good luck on all your future hunts. Oh, by the way, uh, the Freedom Bells are for sale on Ron Spomer Outdoors website too. This is a local sculptor who builds these in celebration of our Second Amendment freedom rights. He calls them the Freedom Bells and they are really fun. If you have someone who is hard to buy for <laughs> or someone who already has everything, I'll bet they don't have one of these. You might want to check them out. Freedom Bells by Doug Adams. This is Ron Spomer. Thanks for listening, everyone. Keep sending in your questions and comments. Until next time, hunt honest and shoot straight.